Hey everybody, what's going on and welcome to Guns N' Roses Central. So today, before we get started with our True Story episode, which I promise you is going to be an amazing episode, I want to give a big shout out to Paul Lynch, who's one of my loyal subscribers, follows me on YouTube and on Facebook. I want to wish him a happy birthday. It's probably a little bit happy belated birthday, but it was his birthday on September 7th. So wishing you all the best. And if you guys could join me in the comments section and also wish Paul a happy birthday, that would be awesome from one Guns N' Roses fan to the next. So let's get started with today's True Story episode. Well, and today I want to do a True Story episode about the artwork behind Appetite for Destruction. Now I should have probably included it in the first two episodes that I did about the album Appetite for Destruction. But because of just time constraints, I thought now would be a good time to actually talk about it. Plus I've got some really cool footage uh, with interviews from the actual artist Robert Williams. But let's talk a bit about the uh, the artwork for Appetite and the original artwork. So the album you guys see right here, this was supposed to be the original album artwork for Appetite for Destruction. But like a lot of things that Guns N' Roses do, there's always controversy. So uh, the actual original painting was done by Robert Williams and it was basically depicted a robot, a robotic rapist about to be punished by a metal Avenger. So after several music retailers refused to stock the album, the label Geffen Records compromised and put the controversial cover art inside the album, replacing it with the image depicting a Celtic cross with skulls of the five band members. Uh, which was actually designed by Billy White Jr. originally as a tattoo. So each skull represents one band member, including Izzy, who was the top skull, Steven Adler, who was the left skull, Axel, who was the center skull, Duff, who was the right skull, and Slash, who was the bottom skull. So in a 2016 interview, Billy White Jr. explained the cross and skulls that looked like the band was Axel's idea, the rest was me, the knot work and the cross was a reference to Thin Lizzy, a band that Axel and I both loved. And even Axel remarked that he wanted to actually show the tattoo to Thin Lizzy's uh, lead vocalist, but unfortunately he passed away before Axel could actually show it to him. Now the back photo of Appetite for Destruction features a, a photo of the band. This was actually taken by the band's photographer Robert John, who worked for the band all the way from like the early club days up until 2002-2003 when he had a falling out with Axel. And the uh, photographs used in the actual liner notes were also taken by Mark Cantor, Jack Lou, who was one of the band's photographers, Leonard McCarty, and Greg Freeman. And the original cover was supposed to be on the 2008 vinyl release uh, that was actually reissued, although the record label replaced it with the Skulls art at the last minute. And the band stated that the artwork is a symbolic social statement with the robot representing the industrial system that's raping and polluting our environment. So a lot of critics thought that Guns N' Roses were promoting rape with the original artwork, but they actually weren't. So uh, in the albums which were issued on double-sided media, uh, the two sides were not conventionally labeled A and B, but G and R, and tracks one to six, which com uh, compose side G, all deal with drugs and hard life in the big city, the gun side, and the remaining tracks which compose the R side all deal with love, sex, and relationship, which is the Roses side. So in an interview with The Metal Show in 2011, Axel stated that the original idea for the cover art was supposed to be a photo of the space shuttle Challenger exploding, which was on the cover of Time Magazine in 1986, but Geffen refused it, saying it was in bad taste. So the painting that Guns N' Roses wanted to use of Robert Williams on Appetite for Destruction, it was actually a 1978 painting and the title of that painting was Appetite for Destruction. So Williams who gained traction while working with the likes of Eddie, Big Daddy, Roth and R. Crumb and participating in the art scene of the After Hours Punk Rock Clubs in the late 60s Hollywood, uh, says the painting in question was not done for the commission of Appetite for Destruction, but rather a specific audience. So he said this was for a select intel intelligent group that loved this kind of shit, says Williams. I made it for the advanced art connoisseurs that came out of the underground in the 60s and 70s. So painted in 1978, the piece was titled Appetite for Destruction well before Rose and his band discovered it. After he agreed to license the image to a then obscure Guns N' Roses, Williams later received a call asking if the band could use the name of the painting as the title of their album. He agreed, unaware of just how huge the record would become. They paid licensing fees as unheard of a punk rock band would have paid, Williams remembers, not a whole lot at all. They were just to me another garage band. So it was Axel who initially saw the image on a postcard somewhere in Los Angeles. So as with many perfect unions, the collaboration started off as the happiest of accidents. So according to Axel, so according to Axel, the painting ended up on a postcard somewhere and Axel Rose walks down Melrose or something and stumbles across that effing postcard and the thing blows his mind, Williams remembers. So he sets out to get in touch with me and it took a long time. No one heard of the band before. It had no previous history. So as explained in this video, Axel submitted the image as a joke for a cover proposal knowing full well how graphic it was. 
but the image seemed to capture something close to the band's anti-institutional image and it ended up as a major contender. I love the picture, but I kind of submitted it as a joke because it was so outrageous to the band and the manager and everybody loved it. So, and I was like, you mean you, you want to use this? I was like, this is great. So we, then we just went for it. People thought we were like promoting rape or something, which is ridiculous, but you know, people interpret, everybody interprets it a painting different ways. Now, what su might surprise a lot of people is that Williams tried to convince the band not to use the image on their album. So due to his experience creating what he terms questionable material, Williams was already familiar with trying to defend shocking or sensational work. While helping to create the counterculture Zap comics with uh, Robert Crumb in the 60s, he saw several people sent to jail and knew that the image would be problematic if it ended up in the mainstream, al mainstream album. This was not for the general public. This was never to go into people's homes, Williams says. Th there is no sophistication in this effing picture. It's overdone cartoon for people who like underground comics and understand underground art, but it's a very small audience. Still, Rose and company were not to be deterred. His agent called up and said, We'd be very interested in this picture, and I said, well, you know, this is not a good idea. This is too violent. You're going to get an awful lot of trouble, Williams remembers. I said, why don't you come to my house, and we'll go through a couple hundred slides, and we'll pick something that might be a little more palatable. And Williams initially thought that Axl Rose was a female, so he tells a story of how he met Axl. He said, so a car pulls up in the front of my house, and this guy gets out, and this other guy gets out. I thought was a girl, Williams recalls, but it was actually Axl Rose. After I got to see he was a guy, he was a nice young fella. I always liked him. He's very polite, shy, and mild-mannered. Eventually, Rose won over Williams, and the artist remembers thinking, if you have the guts to put this on an effing album cover, man, I'm behind you. Now, as I said before, many retailers across the country refused to sell the album because of the artwork. So the shit hit the fan. It was an enormous sensation, and there was a lot of problems with it. And I'm just sitting here saying, well, I told you so, said Robert Williams of the backlash over the artwork. So in response, Geffen Records prepared a tamer cover option. So according to Williams, the image has vengeance and justice in it. So Williams reasoned that there was a story behind the action of the painting, which explained its violent imagery. He said, we've got a girl on the ground that sells toy robots that has been assaulted by another robot, he says, and coming over the fence is an avenging monster to get him, so the picture has a vengeance ju and justice in it. And thinking back on the painting 30 years after it caused such a stir, the artist is still happy with the result. He said, I'm proud of this. This isn't the raciest thing I've done by any means. This is, the, this is kind of tame, Williams says. I do artwork that you'd be nervous if you had it on your wall and your pastor came over. Now here's an MTV report about the actual artwork with an interview with Robert Williams and the band members. Dealing with um, geometry and color is part of the composition. These paintings deal in anxieties, things that tend to upset people. They make me uh, shake a lot, kind of wild. I think it's good to stir people up. We've got a picture here of a gal with a gypsy fortune teller that's forcing the future out of a crystal ball with an old Smith & Wesson pistol. In a painting like this, I'm not selling violence. And I'm not suggesting anything or telling people that, uh, that the child should be electrocuted. And, and, and I'm not even making sport of this child that's going to be electro electrocuted. But I have expressed the feeling of the situation here. This painting deals with all the anxieties and the troubling things that we just really wouldn't want to think about in Peter Pan, like, uh, like cross-dressing and transvestites. This is done in that classic rat fink monster style hot rods, speeding, and bug-eyed monsters, and all kind of devices showing energy. Sex and decadence and cool cars. <laughs> if it commands attention, it's culture. If it matches the couch, it's art. It's that simple. This is the image that caused all the trouble. This, this is the particular oil painting that was used on the album cover, Appetite for Destruction, by the band Guns N' Roses. I love the picture, but I kind of submitted it as a joke because it was so outrageous to the band and the manager. I mean, everybody loved it. So, and I was like, you mean you, you want to use this? I was like, this is great. So we, then we just went for it. People thought we were like promoting rape or something, which is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But, you know, people interpret, everybody interprets it a painting different ways. Let me explain the painting to you. It has a red monster in it. The red monster is jumping over the fence. It is killing the robot because the robot some way violated the, the female vendor of small toy robots. If you don't, don't like him, don't listen to us. If you don't like him, don't look at his it's art. Such it's a simple. Waste of time. I think since it was such an outrageous picture that like 
the skill and the, the talent involved in making it, it gets gets overlooked. And I wanted to be a part of like showing people know this is art. What we've got here is we've got an example of music and art merging. This is this album cover was not a commissioned commercial job to go on the record and the music. This was a separate piece of art from an earlier period. We're dealing with culture, music, and art. Two things that ran together with mutual interest. Robert Williams, what a guy. That's so during the Use Your Illusion tour, Guns N' Roses also had, sometimes had, at least had an inflatable monster as part of their stage set. So this is sh screenshot is taken from their show in Paris from 1992 during Welcome to the Jungle. So they sometimes have it off to the side of the stage. And it really just shows how grandiose and how big their stage production really got. But this is the actual monster from the original uh, cover art for Appetite for Destruction. So if you guys are interested in Robert Williams' artwork, there's actually a whole documentary dedicated to him called Mr. Bitchin. It's from 2013. It's up on YouTube. And I've actually uh, time-stamped it to the uh, section where they interviewed members of Guns N' Roses. And they show some other footage that I haven't shown in this actual video. So you guys can go check it out. So that does it for my True Story episode talking about the artwork behind Appetite for Destruction. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Let me know your thoughts down below. And as always, guys, hit the subscribe button if you love Guns N' Roses and want to see more videos just like this. And hit the like button if you enjoyed the contents of this video. And you guys can follow me on social media and support me on Patreon. The links to all those channels are down below in the description box. Take care.